Hi, everyone. So the main agenda for today is I wanted to go over the Wave Lab, and that was on your homework and uh, uh, partly on your quiz. So, okay, so I opened the Wave Lab. I, I hope you can see it. I think you can, yes. So I opened it and, okay, so you will see a bar underneath A2 that says drag me, drag it. Okay, first of all, let me make this a little bit smaller so I can fit uh, this in my screen. Okay, drag it, okay? So before I drag it, I see just the pure sine wave. And when I drag this bar, now I see two sine waves. So it says you are adding two sine waves. So here they are individually, and here is the sum of the sine waves. How are their wavelengths related? The wavelength of the second sine wave is half of the wavelength of the first sine wave. Now A1 and A2 represent their amplitudes. Observe how the shape of the sum changes as you vary A2. Okay, so below is the sum. So if A2 is very small, it's almost a pure sine wave. And as A2 grows, I start seeing the, the, the finer features, right? So I start seeing the wiggles with periodicity of, the sec, of, the, of this uh, second sine wave. Okay, here's no second sine wave, a little bit. You can see the shape of the sum changes. And you can start seeing the features of the sum that mimic the features of, uh, of the second sine wave. Feature meaning troughs, valleys, peaks, and so on. Okay, each new wavelength component is called a harmonic, okay? Increase the number of active harmonics, meaning the ones with non-zero A, by setting more A's to non-zero. Okay, so let me do that. And I see that I have more and more finer features, right? Because I'm mixing in uh, harmonics that have very, sm uh, very you know, fine periodicity, very small periodicity. So for example, if I add this thing right here, I will add tiny little uh, ripples that correspond to the wavelength of that 11th harmonic. Okay, increase the number of active, okay. Zoom out horizontally using a right uh, plus and minus buttons until you see several repetitions of the net sum. Well, here it is. So I want to call your attention to something. What sets the periodicity of the net sum? Right, so you can see right here, I guess in this particular, uh, Panel. We don't have it, but here I'm going to show you with the mount with the pointer. So you can see that the x or the width, the, the delta x after which the signal repeats actually equals to the wavelength of the first harmonic. Okay, uh, the first harmonic is called fundamental harmonic, and so you can see that. If I start here at x equals zero, and the wavelength here, for example, is what? What is the wavelength of the fundamental harmonic? I guess it's 0 0.78 meters. Um, you can see that when I go from zero to that to x equals that wavelength, all the other harmonics also go through integer number of oscillations. And therefore, the whole thing repeats after x equals one wavelength, and then two wavelengths of the fundamental of the fundamental harmonic. On the other hand, if I go from x equals zero to like somewhere here, well, that's one, two, three, four oscillations of that pink harmonic, but that's not even half of the oscillation of the fundamental harmonic. Only when you go to x equals wavelength, that's when all the other harmonics repeat as well. 
So you, therefore the periodicity of the net sum is set by the periodicity or the wavelength of the fundamental harmonic. In the graph controls, make sure it says space. Okay, it says space. Under math mode, select wavelength. Okay, so I'm gonna click wave math mode and it's gonna display uh, mathematical representations of each harmonic and of the sum. Okay, it says wavelength and look at the formula for each mode as well as the sum. Okay, so here are the formulas. Uh, now select, next select the wave number. So if I select the wave number, so pay attention to this, uh, the math form of the nth harmonic. Um, if I select the wave number, it looks simpler, it looks cleaner. Um, what is the relationship between lambda and k? So you can see just by definition, k equals two pi over lambda. We'll talk about the physical meaning of that in just a second, but just the math, k sub n is just two pi over lambda sub n. It's just cleaner. Um, remember that this is the definition of k, two pi over lambda. Now select mode. Before I select mode, um, let's look at the wavelength again. So look at this. And what is, how are the wavelengths related? So if the wavelength of the fundamental harmonic is L, the wavelength of the second harmonic here, let, so you can see it, is L over two, right? The wavelength of the sec second harmonic is, I'm not sure why the third, let me reset all. Right, so this is L and the wavelength of the second harmonic is exactly L over two. The wavelength of the third harmonic is L over three, right? So you can see that it's L over three. And so, So lambda one equals L, lambda two equals L over two, lambda three equals L over three. So when I substitute that in, I get this, where the N is explicit, right? So, but again, the difference between this and this is just lambda N equals uh, L over N. Okay, so this is the representation in, in which uh, the explicit counter of the mode, in which the counter of the mode is explicit. Now select the time t and repeat the same steps, okay? So if the meaning of the x-axis is not space but, but time, well, then the meaning of the stuff that sits in front of uh, the time is as follows. Instead of the wavelength, you have the period, the period of each harmonic. Instead of the wave number, you have angular frequency. Okay, and the modal description is still the same, right? So the period, the period of the fundamental harmonic is t, the big t. The period of the second harmonic is t over two. The period of the third harmonic, harmonic is t over three. And therefore, if you rewrite this in terms of the counter of the harmonic, get an expression that looks like this. Um, what is frequency? Frequency is how frequently something happens. So if I dribble a basketball five times a second, no, not five, that's too many, two times a second, the period of each bounce is half a second. If um, something happens at frequency 12 hertz, it means in one second, there are 12 cycles of that something. The wheel rotates at frequency of 12 hertz. That means the wheel, 12 cycles of the wheel's rotation happen during one second. And so the period is 1 12th of a second. That's why t equals one over f. So f, the regular frequency, tells us the number of cycles per second. The angular frequency gives us the number of radians per second. To convert from cycles to radians, we multiply by two pi. That's why omega, angular frequency, is two pi and the frequency. There is no name for something like one over lambda, uh, the equivalent of the frequency. But the equivalent of the, of the angular frequency in the spatial domain is called wave number. 
So if angular frequency is the number of radians per second, then the wave number is number of radians per meter. So for example, if this had a, if, if this was a spatial signal, for example, imagine it's like a sand dune and then the sand dune has a certain shape. We can represent it as a sum of the sinusoids because you, you can represent any periodic signal as a sum of sinusoids. Now let's say the sand dunes had this kind of a shape. And so here's each harmonic, right? So the, the, num uh, the number of, for each harmonic, the number of uh, radians per meter, okay, is called the wave number. But again, it's just math. If that bothers you, that doesn't click, if that doesn't get through, just remember k equals two pi over lambda, omega equals two pi over t. I think with omega, it's a little bit easier, right? So if regular frequency is number of cycles per second, then angular frequency is number of radians per second, and wave number is number of radians per meter. If it's a spatial signal. Okay, so that's just basic waves. Um, and traveling waves, so let's, let's go back to, to this. How do you make, how do you shift a function? Right? Let's say I, I go back to just pure, um, pure sine wave. You subtract something in the argument, right? So if I want to shift it by L over four, the argument of the sine will be Kx minus L over four. That shifts it to the right. What if I want to keep shifting it continuously? Well, that shift has to be a function of time. So in general, if I want the thing to travel, it will have this kind of a form. Now, if I freeze time and take a picture, like I take a photo with my phone, well, I will get this. So here, time is frozen. Time is set to some value. And I'm looking at the, fun of the for example, this is a water wave. I'm looking at the surface elevation as a function of x, as a function of space. That's called a snapshot graph. On the other hand, if I plant a rubber ducky at some location, for example, x equals l, and I record the elevation of the rubber ducky as a function of time, so what I'm doing now is I'm fixing the value of x, and I'm plotting the deflection of the rubber ducky as a function of time. That's called the history graph. And the actual wave is a function of both space and time, and if the dependence on space and time is, is, is in the form of this combination, this combo, kx minus omega t, then the sine wave does not change the shape. Now, what's the speed of the wave? Well, during one period of rubber duckies up and down motion, exactly one wavelength of the wave must pass through that point. So the speed of the wave is one wavelength per period, lambda over big T. Multiply and divide by two pi, you will get K, uh, you will get omega over K. Okay, so the speed is, um, speed of the wave is uh, lambda over period or omega over K. Okay. Uh, then I had asked you to do the wave game. Well, this one is too easy. And the point here is just so that you gain intuition for the idea that you can always get the wave shape that you want by appropriately adjusting the weights by which each, by which different harmonics are represented, right? So when I'm adjusting the A sub n, I'm, represent, I'm adjusting the weight or the, the strength with which each harmonic is represented. Okay, so now the main thing. It says, now click on discrete to continue. So, okay, I just did. In the upper part of your control panel, choose two pi for the spacing between Fourier components. Okay, I'm going to do that. And immediately notice that the spacing between the Fourier components is also the value of the wave number. That's why it says K1. You see the spacing between the Fourier components 
also happens to be the spacing between zero and k1, so equals to k1. Uh, note that k sub n have units of radiance per meter. So for example, k equals two pi really means two pi per meter. Okay, so yes, the units of k are two pi per meter. For the wave packet center, choose 12 pi. Okay, it's already chosen. Again, that means 12 pi per meter. And for the wave packet width, choose four pi. Okay, so now I'm set. I followed the directions. Okay. Zoom out horizontally so you can see at least three wave packets. So these things are wave packets, okay? So the top panel tells me the, the magnitude or the weight by which each harmonic is represented. The middle panel plots all of those harmonics together and the bottom, the bottom panel just plots the sum. Write up answers to magenta questions. Okay, so here we go. Question six. The upper panel lists a series of vertical bars for A1, a2, et cetera. What information do the values of these bars convey? I, what do the bars mean? They represent the magnitude with which each harmonic is represented. They represent uh, the, the relative dominance or the relative weight of each harmonic. Um, what does it mean physically for one bar to be taller uh, than another? What effect does it have on the sum? Well, if one bar is taller than the other, it means that, that har the harmonic at that k is more strongly represented in the sum than the harmonic at the other k. So in particular, for this situation we're looking at, the harmonic with wave number 12 pi, or wavelength uh, 2 pi over 12 pi, so that's 1 sixth of a meter, is the dominant harmonic, not to be confused with fundamental harmonic, that's K1. The dominant harmonic is the one that's sort of the loudest, if you wish. Um, okay. Note, note the yellow measuring device in the upper panel and yellow measuring device in the lower panel, note it. Try to adjust the spacing between the Fourier components tuning knob at the top of the control panel. So I'm gonna switch from two pi to pi to e pi, okay? So the spacing is smaller. And so K1 therefore is also smaller. We just discussed that the spacing between Fourier components also happens to be the value uh, of the wave number of the fundamental harmonic. Q2A, what do you notice about the spacing between the wave packets in the lower panel? Well, as the spacing between the Fourier components is decreased, the spacing between the wave packets is increased. In other words, what sets the separation between the wave packets? Well, the spacing between the Fourier components, which also happens to be K1. So K1, K1 controls the separation. We already discussed it that you have a bunch of harmonics, the periodicity of the sum equals to the wavelength of the fundamental harmonic, lambda one. And we see that, we see precisely that. So here's a bar of length lambda one. And so therefore K1 or the spacing between the harmonics sets the separation between the wave packets. Q to B, how can you explain this observation? I already did that the periodicity of the wave packets equals the periodicity of the fundamental harmonic. Because when the fundamental harmonic repeats, all the other harmonics uh, repeat. And when the say third harmonic repeats, well, the fundamental harmonic isn't done yet. It's only after delta x equals to the lambda one, that's when everybody repeats. What happens to the spacing between each wave packet as the spacing between Fourier component gets smaller and smaller? Well, the spacing between the wave packets gets larger and larger. They get further and further apart, right? So we can see that they get further and further apart because lambda one grows. And so you can see in the continuum limit, we will not have periodicity. We'll just have one lonely 
wave packet. Now make the spacing between the Fourier components pi over four, okay, boom, right there, pi over four. This means that the largest wavelength is how long? The largest wavelength is wavelength of the fundamental harmonic. So if k1 is pi over four, lambda one is two pi over k1, so two pi over pi over four, that's eight, eight meters. And indeed we see that the spacing or the period or the spatial periodicity between the uh, the wave packets is eight meters and lambda one is eight meters. Okay. By the way, if this was time, right, that this would be eight seconds. Okay. It's really just sort of interpretation, right? Except that the meaning of instead of k's, you now have omegas. Okay. Uh, and instead of space, you have time. You should be equally comfortable to toggle between one and the other. Okay, so I answered Q3A, Q3B. How does this number come about, right? Uh, well, uh, recall the relationship between K and lambda because uh, lambda one equals two pi over K1. And the smallest, uh, smallest wave number is K1, so the largest wave length is two pi over K1. In this case, it's eight. Some of these questions are somewhat repetitive. And nine, I'm just calling your attention that another way to see why decreasing K1 or decreasing the spacing increases the uh, separation between wave packets is because as you're packing more and more harmonics, the region of space where they all come to an agreement become rarer and rarer. So you can see right here, the region where you have fully constructive interference is quite narrow. This is the width of that region. But if you have fewer harmonics, the region, the, the region you see, uh, if you have fewer harmonics, the regions where they all come to an agreement are more common. That's what I'm trying to say in nine. Right, so you see, right, so you have to go really quite far until they all agree again, which is right, right about here. Uh, set the spacing between the Fourier components to zero. So now this is the continuum limit. Well, that means K1 is zero, which means lambda one is infinity. So we are never gonna see repeating wave packets. It's gonna be just one lonely wave packet in the center padded by infinity on each side. Uh, okay, so now A of K is a continuum function. It is called a Fourier transform and sometimes it's also called Fourier spectrum. So now we're adding up a continuum infinity of harmonics. Note that before we can also add up infinite number of harmonics, but that's a discrete infinity. Now it's a continuum infinity. With a discrete infinity, you see the shape of the wave packet is almost the same, but the wave packets eventually repeats, repeat. With a continuum infinity, well, first of all, they don't repeat, and finally you're just adding up infinite number of these guys, so that's kind of a limiting shape uh, of this wave packet. Okay, um, okay, what is the meaning of A evaluated at some particular K? For example, what does A at 14 pi per meter mean? Well, again, it's the same as before. It's the amplitude or the magnitude by which that particular harmonic is represented. It's somewhat imprecise. To be more precise, I have to talk about the meaning of A of K times DK, but I'm not going to do that. So what I said in Plain English is good enough. It's, it conveys, conveys the intuition. Now zoom onto the wave packet. So it's taking up the whole uh, of the bottom window. Done. Check the X space envelope and check the width and the indicators. Now the space envelope is just to guide the eye. The actual wave packet is this. But you can, you can see that it's sort of bounded by this thing. It's just to guide the eye and people call it envelope. And if this was time, this would be time space envelope. Okay, so 
By the way, math, notice that a discrete sum of Fourier series has been turned into an integral. Oh, it's stuck. It has been turned into an integral of this form. A of k is called Fourier uh, transform. So A of k sort of contains the same information as the signal itself or as the wave packet itself. Uh, it's just represented in a different way. So if I, if you, if I give you the magnitude with which each Fourier component is represented, that's equivalent to giving you the wave packet itself, right? So instead of giving you the value of the wa wave packet at some particular x, I can give you a set, I can give you the value, uh, uh, I can give you the weight with which a particular harmonic is represented, and that contains the same information. <sighs> Just represent it in a different way. Uh, okay, so does Q, Q5A, does changing the location of the wave packet center change the overall width of the packet? What I, what I was trying to say, does changing the location of the Fourier transform center change the overall, overall width of the packet, the envelope width? Okay, so this is also called the width in real space. So pay, pay close, close attention. So move the wave packet center knob, uh, wa wave packet center. Okay, I see it's called wave packet center, but it's really the center of the Fourier transform. So as I'm changing this, you see the center of the Fourier transform is moved around. But if you pay close attention, you can see that this red arrow that represents the width of the wave packet remains the same. So you see it goes from minus 0.1 to plus 0.1, slightly less than 0.1. So it's about 0.2. As I'm changing the location of the Fourier transform, they should really call this Fourier transform center, but fine. As I'm changing the location of the center of the Fourier transform, you can see that there's some, something happening to the wave packet, it changes the sh shape, but the envelope does not change. It's actually still between minus 0.1 and plus 0.1. The answer is no. If you pay close attention, you will see that the envelope width does not depend. It's, it's insensitive to the position of the center of the Fourier transform. Thus changing the location of the wave packet center change the overall width of the Fourier spectrum? No, it just shifts it from 1k, it just shifts it all along the k axis, okay? So the width in k space, this is called k space, this is called real space. The width in k space is not affected by where the center is, obviously. So what does it do to the wave packet? It says pay close attention to the internal structure. Well, it changes the width of these internal wiggles. So pay close attention, you can see this is, where the wave pack, the Fourier transform center is towards the lower end. And now I'm gonna move it towards the higher end and you can see, for some reason it's stuck. Oh, right here. You can see the wiggles become a little bit narrower. Now, how can you explain it physically? Well, the wave pack, the center of the Fourier transform uh, really represents the wave number or the wavelength or the harmonic that is rep that is most dominant okay and that is basically that quasi sine wave right here so if it's the most dominant if the most dominant wave number is 12 pi the most dominant wavelength is one sixth of a meter right so what is one sixth of a meter uh one divided by six is 0.16, about 0.2. And you can see that the, the wavelength of this quasi sine wave is 0.2. If I make the dominant, the most dominant wave number, something like 15 pi, well, now it's two over 15. Uh, so let's see, two divided by 15, 
it's 0.13. So the wavelength of this quasi sine wave is now more like 0.13 of a, of a meter and vice versa. So the reason that the internal structure changes is because the internal structure is reflective of the most dominant wave number or the most dominant wavelength. Now place, and that's the meaning of the wave number at which AFK is largest. Place the center of AFK at 12 pi, okay, placed. Now what I'm going to do is now uh, vary uh, the upper knob of the wave packet width. Again, it really should be called the Fourier transform width, but that's fine. Uh, this knob tunes the width of the Fourier transform. Right? So I'm going to make the width of the Fourier transform smaller, and you can see that the width of the wave packet is larger. As I make the width of the uh, Fourier transform larger, the width of the wave packet is smaller. Okay. And that's Q6A. That's sort of the, the biggest, the most important thing I wanted you to get out of this. Uh, so far, this is just the math of waves. Forget quantum mechanics for a second. Okay, this is just waves. This is 19th century mathematics. Pay close attention to the periodicity of the internal wiggles. Is it affected by sigma k, the width of the Fourier transform or the width of the envelope? No, it's not. So uh, as, I as I'm making, as I'm tuning this knob right here, you see the internal wiggles, the wavelength of these internal wiggles remains the same. But as the width of the Fourier spectrum gets smaller, the signal more and more closely approximates a pure sine wave, which makes sense because there's fewer and fewer wave numbers mixed in with an appreciable amplitude. So it almost becomes the pure sine wave. So it does make sense that as the width of the Fourier transform becomes smaller, the width of the real space uh, envelope or the real space wave packet becomes larger because in the limit, it will be just a pure sine wave that's infinitely wide, okay? Q7A, decreasing the width of the Fourier transform increases the width of the wave packet. U7b, increasing the width of the Fourier transform decreases the width of the, uh, of the wave packet. So now in the, upper, in the other limit, when the Fourier transform is very broad, when the spectrum has a large band width, you're mixing in more and more harmonics, and therefore the region of space where they all agree, where they all interfere construct constructively becomes narrower and narrower. If you have more and more people, it's harder and harder for everyone to agree. And that's how you can, that's sort of a way to see why increasing the width of the Fourier transform decreases the width of the signal and vice versa. Now Q7 increasing the K at which the peak is located. Well, we already discussed that. That decreases the wavelength or the period of the internal wiggles, the, the, the quasi sine wave of the internal wiggles and vice versa. In plain English, what does the Fourier transform tell us? What's the meaning of this quantity? Uh, the way that it's represented in this simulation, it simply represents the magnitude of the magnitude by which each Fourier component is represented. Now, what this simulation does not does not have is it does not have uh, phase shifts uh, between each Fourier component. So, in, in principle, Fourier transform also includes the phase information, but not in the simulation. In this simulation, it just represents the relative weight, the relative magnitude, or the relative strength of each Fourier component. Okay. Again, this is just the math of waves. And I just wanted you to understand what's going on here. This will be very useful as we uh, continue talking. And why is it useful for quantum mechanics? Because the way that we're presenting quantum mechanics to you is it's quantum mechanics is basically wave mechanics. And therefore, obviously, understanding these things about waves is important.